Hello and welcome to today's FP conference call. We're excited to connect with you virtually to analyze the world's biggest events with foreign policies experts. My name is Amelia Lester and I am FP's executive editor and happy to be your host this morning. Today, I'm joined by FP's new Latin America brief writer, Catherine Os Osborne, to get her take on the recent elections that have taken place across the region and take a look ahead to those that are coming. This year, nine countries in Latin America will hold elections, and many include a presidential vote. So just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. We want to hear from you. We'll be weaving in questions from our global audience as we go along. So if you're on Zoom, click on the Q&A button below to submit your questions. And please be sure to tell us your name and where you're writing from. And if you're joining us on the phone, you can email us your questions. The address is web, W-E-B, at foreignpolicy.com. So let's get started. Catherine, can you talk about what you're looking for in the elections over the course of this year? Latin America has to be one of the world's hardest hit regions by COVID-19. So I imagine voters might be responding to pandemic management. But is there anything else that you're watching for? There is, and very happy to be with everyone today to discuss this. One element to watch for is definitely whether COVID and its strain on health systems and economies translates into a demand for stronger social protection in these, in these countries. That will affect what their recoveries look like. That can be seen in people's choices for presidents and also in the process of choosing delegates for Chile's upcoming constitutional drafting process. Another thing to watch for is could these countries start cooperating with each other more after a real stalling in regional diplomacy, particularly on the issue of Venezuela? And lastly, what's also interesting about this year's elections is that many of them are the first elections since a string of political crises in South America in late 2019. So that was right before the pandemic. Within only a few weeks, Chile, Bolivia, Colombia, and Ecuador saw nationwide protest. Those were sparked for different reasons. Some people even called it a Latin American spring. And now we have the chance to see whether those demands were channeled into political parties that are successful in these elections. That would be a sign of democracy working well in these countries, um, which is not a given because many of them are young democracies and they're still trying to get strong institutions on their feet. So let's move to maybe talking about some of the specific elections that have been happening recently, starting with Ecuador. So the candidate that was chosen by the former president, Rafael Correa, did not win. So what can Andreas Arauz's loss say about Correa's legacy in Ecuador? Arauz's loss represents a real rejection of Correa's legacy. And a key factor that helped decide Sunday's elections were actually the third place and the fourth place candidates in the first round of the election. Uh, they were running in left-wing parties, including uh, being supported by many people who supported Correa in the past, but today define themselves in opposition to him. They say they're more democratic and they're more environmentally friendly. So Correa's government often used police repression and detentions against people who disagreed with him, including against the third place presidential candidate environmentalist, Yaku Perez. So in the past, Perez was actually arrested several times by Correa's government. And in the runoff, the candidate from the fourth place party, the Democratic left, endorsed Lasso, who ended up winning, and Yaku Perez told his followers to cast null votes or to spoil their ballots. Both of those ended up being decisive. There was around a 16% null vote count. That's almost double the number of null votes in the first round. And you can see that that's different, that's higher than the difference between Arauz and the election winner, which is right-wing Guillermo Lasso. Effectively, Ecuadorian voters were sending a message that they preferred a right-wing candidate who pledged to be more democratic than Correa's protege. Um, to Arauz's credit, he conceded defeat on election night. He gave a very conciliatory speech calling for a new way of doing politics in the country. And the victor Lasso also set a very democratic tone. He said he didn't aim to politically persecute anyone. And Peru also went to the polls this week and there was a big shock result there because the two candidates who are going to advance to the next round are Pedro Castillo and Kaiko Fujimori. Um, Castillo is a leftist school teacher and a union organizer and Kaiko Fujimori is a far right daughter of a political dynasty. 
So I want to ask you what it means when the two candidates in the runoff are so diametrically opposed politically. But I also want to bring in a question from Franz Baresi, who writes, is the socialist candidate in Peru, that is Castillo, likely to win the runoff? Sure. So these two candidates are each proposing system shock in different ways. Keiko often summarizes her campaign by saying it's mano dura, it will have hardline security policies, and Castillo wants to nationalize industries like oil and gas, mining, and hydropower. So their success speaks to Peruvians being really fed up with politics as usual. Um, another factor behind their success is each had important networks of support outside of Lima, the capital. And when you have such a fragmented field like this, um, with lots of candidates bringing in very low amounts of support, that really makes a difference. Castillo, for example, was supported by teachers, unions, countrywide, and also by a network of rural self-defense patrols. Keiko has a very hardcore base of supporters that extends outside of Lima as well. People who, for example, were happy with Peru's economy under her father, Alberto Fujimori. About the chances of Castillo's success, um, one interesting thing about Castillo is he's a union leader. So he has been negotiating all his life and he's more used to um, conceding and building broad coalitions than Keiko, who tends to dig her heels in. Um, because he is proposing such radical things, nationalizing these industries, he's saying that he might uh, close the Congress if it doesn't agree with him on some issues, which is truly radical. And you would think that, oh, a Peruvian Democrat would automatically reject that. Um, but even so, he immediately after the first round said, I want to work with anyone, you know, my doors are open to building these broad coalitions. And there's a very high anti-Fujimori vote as well, just as well as there's a sort of strong base of support for her. So even though you could say, oh, um, it's likely to go to Keiko, I don't think anything's guaranteed at this point, And a lot can happen in the almost two months since the next round, until the next round. So I guess the answer for France is we just don't know Right now. We don't we don't know, but a lot of people wrote off this candidate in the first round and underestimated, I think, his connection with um, working class Peruvians. His whole imagery was built around this. He wore a straw hat all the time. He rode a horse to vote. And there was even another leftist candidate who was very strong, um, but just seemed like more of a political insider. And Peruvians really broke hard for somebody who was a sort of a man of the people and an outsider, which um, that sentiment may appear again in the second round. I want to get to that notion of system shock that you mentioned a lot of people in um, in the country are feeling. But just before we do that, you mentioned the network of rural self-defense patrols. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? That sounds like mm -hmm. a potent political force in this election. Yes, so these are patrols that um, when there was a left-wing guerrilla group, the Shining Path, very active in Peru, they would defend local communities against that guerrilla group. And actually Castillo himself was active in that defense. So it is a very um, national network. It's spread out across countryside and it has a lot of power to spread support for a certain candidate. Castillo is somebody who had very little Twitter followers. His party didn't even have a Twitter until a couple of days ago. So it is these strong um, rural networks that were very powerful in his victory. And again, um, they were sort of underestimated one time and, and I would say it's best to not underestimate them again. Just staying on this particular race, we have a question from Patrick Duddy from Duke University who writes, what is the likelihood of De Soto and Lopez strongly supporting Keiko? Interesting, Lopez Aliaga, uh, who is one of these two right-wing candidates that, that the question mentioned, um, has already said, oh, I like Castillo, that he's a big social conservative and he's a Christian. So, um, Again, I think it's possible that they might not break along left-right lines in which the two right-wing candidates, De Soto and Lopez Aliaga, would support Keiko, um, but one of them might break along social conservative lines. And Castillo is this Christian, um, highly socially conservative, against gay marriage, um, against expanding abortion rights. Um, so I think it's possible that um, it's possible that they support Keiko, but I think it's not a given. So taking a step back from those particular candidates, you mentioned that there's this widespread kind of desire to, to 
to make a break with the status quo. There's a, there's a sense of system shock. Can you speak about why Peruvians are so fed up with their political system? There's a perception of widespread corruption within Peru's political system. Since the last elections, Peru was hit with fallout of the Operation Car Wash anti-corruption probe, which implicated several former presidents. And in Peru's November 2020 crisis, then President Martin Vizcarra had taken unusually strong anti-corruption measures. He made a lot of enemies in Congress who then impeached him. In addition to the issue of corruption, there is the issues of fragmentation and also low quality public goods. So fragmentation, political parties in Peru are historically much more fragmented and weaker than in other peer countries, in part because they were smothered during the Fujimori rule of 1990 to 2000. And you can see that degree of fragmentation in Sunday's results. The winning candidate only got about 19% of valid votes and only around 16% of all votes. Lastly, Peru is one of the South American countries that invests the lowest amount of its budget in health and education. And what that means is Peruvians experience poor quality public goods in their day-to-day -day lives. They don't see evidence that politicians are seen in the high results for Castillo, who really played out this political outsider, everyday, non-political elite Peruvian. I'm just going to mention an FP article that um, that Duddy and other viewers might be interested in by Michael Albertus. It's an argument on Peru's broken body politic, and we'll put a link to that um, in the Zoom chat. Um, moving on to Bolivia's elections, a runoff vote there handed leadership in four of the country's nine departments to candidates who are not from the governing party. So that's the MOS, the party of former president Ivo Morales. What does this result mean for the MOS? It doesn't seem like a good one for them. The MOS is coming off a real crisis that it faced in 2019. It was part of that wave of crises that I mentioned earlier. And that was when Morales tried to seek a fourth presidential term. There was lots of public opposition. He had previously lost a referendum on whether he could be allowed to do this, but courts ruled in his favor. The election was disputed. There was mass protest and Morales fled Bolivia. And that was such a bitter moment because Bolivia's democracy is young. The country emerged from military rule in the early 80s. And Morales had brought a lot of progress uh, regarding reducing poverty, for example. But for many people, what the MAS was starting to stand for was insisting on holding on to power for too long. And that's why it was really important when Luis Arce who is seen as more moderate, ran for president last year and he won in a smooth election. Now come these local elections. And what we're seeing is that the MAS is definitely still the most powerful political force in the country, but it's losing ground to opponents who are both right-wing and a more moderate left. So in the runoff Sunday of these four opposition governors who won, two are indigenous politicians, one is a doctor and one is a more pro-market economist. All this to say, zooming out, if you look at the three countries that had elections Sunday, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, Bolivia is more similar to Ecuador in that you have, broadly speaking, three main political groups that are fairly consolidated. They are represented now well in Congress and in local government. And so in this post-crisis phase for these countries, their main demands are represented by elected leaders. That's healthy democratic progress. Whereas in Peru, it's much more worrying because of that fragmentation. Yeah, what I'm hearing is that it's really hard to, to draw any strong trend lines along ideological lines in these various elections. It seems like there's a mix of left and right wing leaders emerging across the region. And that's interesting because in the 90s and the early 2000s, Latin America was known for this strong turn to the left, which then got reversed, um, including the departure of Korea. So what does the mix of left and right across the region mean for politics and diplomacy? So as far as regional diplomacy, there was unity.
So it looks like Catherine is frozen at the moment. I will just um, talk about a question that we received from Chris Morfast, who writes, is 2022 the year Gustavo Petro is elected president of Colombia? Um, Petro is the candidate who lost the last election. He does maintain a strong base of support, um, but we might, once Catherine comes back on, check in on the status of his campaigning um, for the 2022 election um, coming up. Um, also, uh, Jesus Duran from Mexico is writing about um, if Marina's party wins or loses, um, what's, how's that gonna look? I think he's asking how Mexico is gonna look to other countries after those elections. And we'll also try and address that question once Catherine comes back on. She did warn us that her internet connection typically drops out once or twice a day in Rio, but hopefully she'll be able to get back on soon. Opa, can you hear me, Amelia? I can. Yeah, so sorry about that. My internet dropped for a bit. Um, should I just jump back in? That'd be great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let's see. So the unity in the past had led to this health cooperation. It included disease surveillance, purchasing mass drugs. And what we're seeing is now there's a mix of leaders as far as political alignment, and some of them are trying to re-engage in regional cooperation. So for example, Alberto Fernandez, the president of Argentina has worked with some other presidents facilitating documentation for Russian vaccines to arrive in their countries. Um, that's one example, but overall regional cooperation is currently quite low. And the issue to watch here is the possibility that better coordination can lead to a better result on Venezuela's political crisis. In the former left-wing wave, it was some of those leaders' reluctance to condemn authoritarian measures in Venezuela that lost them voter confidence. So if these new left-wing leaders really are less ideological, if they're more moderate, it will open up the possibility that they could help push toward a peaceful and democratic transition in Venezuela, potentially even working together with right-wing leaders. I have a related question on that. Um, we, we are going to talk more about the pandemic as well, but um, Matias Gonzalez, writing from Chile, um, he says, my question is more related to a general view of Latin America. Recent election outcomes in the region seem to be unpredictable in terms of the political label or political path that the region will move into the right or the left. So in your opinion, are there other key factors or major causes of this um, in addition to COVID-19? I guess you were referencing one um, when you were talking about Venezuela and regional reactions, um, but are there any other factors you see? Yeah, I mean, if we, broadly speaking, um, because of the pandemic, but not only because of the pandemic, um, Latin America is in a very anti-incumbent moment right now. So as far as um, voter evaluations of, is the health system working for me? Um, is, you know, unemployment insurance working for me? That's very pandemic related, but then also because of these crises that came in 2019, um, folks have lost faith in the parties that were uh, dominant in those countries right before the pandemic. So as far as factors to look at, I would look at um, what are costs of living like in these countries. Inflation is causing food prices to rise in a lot of them. Um, gasoline prices are going up as well. So I think it's safe to say that a voter today versus um, one or two years ago is probably happier saying out with this, out with this system politician, and you can expect a bit of an anti-incumbency um, sentiment in these elections. A fascinating question from Robert Carlson in Washington, DC, who writes, do the results in Ecuador and Bolivia signal a break between indigenous groups and the political left? That's a great question. And they do um, signal fractures. Specifically in Ecuador, Pachacutic, which is the party that Yacu Pérez ran in, is the party of the indigenous movement. And the Correa administration really pushed hard on projects surrounding natural resource extraction, and they didn't listen very well to indigenous protesters who said, uh, you need to consult our community more before doing this project here. 
And that division was so pronounced that it really does appear that the Indigenous Party's instruction to vault null to spoil your ballot um, was decisive in Ecuador. They're also very well represented in Congress now. They're the second biggest party in Congress. And so we're going to see um, much more checks from the legislature on Lasso's intentions, for example, to do um, extractive projects. In uh, Bolivia, there's also this sort of fissure going on. There's an independent uh, indigenous candidate called Eva Copa, who won an important mayoral election in La Paz, Bolivia's second biggest city, which is very emblematic of the fact that it's not so automatic anymore that anybody in Bolivia who's indigenous is going to support the mass and support Morales and Arce. And in fact, um, many of these candidates who won the runoffs this Sunday were people who were affiliated, strongly affiliated with the MAS in the past, and since then have broken from the party in resistance to essentially what they say is to closed door leadership at the top. So it's a trend that I think we'll continue to see. Um, I also got a I, I would love to move to Brazil and talk a little bit about um, environmental policies there. But Sonia Wolf writes, can you comment about the upcoming Chilean elections? Sure. So Chile is going to both elect um, delegates to its constitutional assembly and it's going to have a presidential election this year. The backdrop is that these 2019 protests that really paralyzed Chile led to a huge, very interesting process of national dialogue in the country, small events um, happening around the country and the conclusion that they're gonna rewrite their constitution. So delegates will be elected with the gender parity system, which means half of them will be men and half of them will be women. And there's also a lot of spots reserved for independent candidates. So people who wanna help write the constitution, but they don't come from a political party. And what we can see so far is that the national backdrop is that Piñera, the president, who's a center-right president, is, has very low popularity right now. And it was going up a bit because Chile's success in the vaccination campaign, but now they're having another wave of COVID and it's quite low. And so you would expect essentially that the left and candidates from the left would have um, higher participation in this constitutional assembly. But what's interesting is that actually right-wing parties have all unified and are backing the same group of candidates. So you may actually see a more balanced constitutional assembly, which means the new constitution um, may not be so different than the, the current one, which the critique is that it gives too much uh, private sector preference for things like pensions and education and things like that. So one thing to watch is, you know, who are gonna be these new authors of the new constitution? What political forces do they represent? And then you have the presidential election in Chile. Again, because of this anti-incumbency feeling, because of Piñera's low approval, um, you could say that he and, and his successor don't bode very well in this election, but also um, you have to look at divisions between the left to see who might um, surface in his place. John Perkins from Seattle asks, how does China's rising investment and trade power impact the future? Unfortunately, a fascinating question, a very big one, which we won't have time for, but Oliver Stunkel has written a piece for FP about Latin American governments being caught in the middle of the US-China tech war that we're going to um, post in the um, Zoom chat. Um, so I guess wrapping up here, maybe with a, a final question about Brazil, um, it was reported in 2020 that deforestation in the Amazon hit a 12 year high, and that was up almost 10% from the previous year. How has President Jair Bolsonaro contributed to that? And what are some of the other impacts his policies are having on the environment in Brazil? Bolsonaro weakened the Environmental Protection Agency, IBAMA. He encouraged more farming and mining in the Amazon. And he also for a time put the military in charge of preventing deforestation. His actions led Norway and Germany to even suspend financial support for Amazon production. And the results numerically are that deforestation rose 34% in 2019 and 9% again in 2020. Essentially, the army doesn't have the same capabilities or incentives to really do the work of stopping deforestation. Furthermore, Brazil updated its Paris Accord commitment in December. That's when countries are supposed to present their new, more ambitious goals, and Brazil, in fact, did not update its plans. It kept the same emissions reduction target. And it even said Brazil must receive $10 billion per year in order to reach those goals without explaining how the money will be used. So that's caused some tensions. 
And can Joe Biden do anything to pressure Bolsonaro on the environment? What's interesting is that Biden suggested in a debate during the campaign that Brazil face economic consequences if it doesn't stop deforestation. Bolsonaro really criticized that comment. He said it was a threat to Brazil's sovereignty. And now that Biden is actually in office, he's taking another tactic, which is consulting um, with Brazilian diplomats, conducting closed door discussions with the Brazilian government about the possibility of some kind of deal on rainforest protection. Those talks reached a real impasse recently because Brazil, like it did in its new update to the Paris commitment, asked for a financial commitment before demonstrating any progress, which Washington didn't want to commit to. That's thought to be one of the reasons why a top White House aide is skipping Brazil in his tour of South America this week. In addition, Brazilian environmental and indigenous groups issued an open letter opposing this closed door negotiation strategy because they're not included in it. They say, we as the people who live in the Amazon know uh, what needs to be in place for changes to occur. And just a few days ago, the US ambassador to Brazil told politicians that the ball is in Brazil's court. And so the US is waiting to see um, when this big April 22nd, 23rd climate summit comes, what Brazil is gonna say. We got a couple of questions about Mexico, and um, I guess for a final question, let's touch on them. Um, Joan Felbaum Vidra asks, um, how has the president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, kept up his popularity? He's a very skilled media strategist. He's very good at having uh, these daily press conferences that are very long in which he repeats his message over and over again and sort of creates new media facts that then the press has to report on. Um, additionally, the, the previous administration in Mexico um, was not very open to voters or to uh, people in the countryside. And Lopez Obrador frequently travels through Mexico um, going to events, meeting people, and really working this image as also, I'm the man of the people. So Mexico, if you think about it, um, its economy hasn't suffered as much as South America during the pandemic because it's so linked to the United States. And so despite Mexico not um, investing a lot in uh, income support during the pandemic, like some of the other countries in the region did, it's sort of having this uh, side effect of the stimulus in the United States and jobs uh, haven't been lost there in the same scale. So I would say it's a combination of his communication strategy um, and not as much financial desperation as in other places. Well, unfortunately, Unfortunately, we are all out of time here. You are such a wealth of information, Catherine. I feel so lucky to have been able to pick your brain here today about a very tumultuous time in the region. I just want to encourage everyone on the call to keep reading Catherine's Latin America brief every week and all our other great newsletters about various regions around the world are available on our website, which is foreignpolicy.com forward slash newsletters. And one more announcement before we wrap up, which I think will be interesting to everyone who tuned in today. I want to make sure you know about FP's inaugural climate summit, which is happening two weeks um, from now um, on April 27 and 28. It's a real packed two-day program. It features senators, it features government leaders, expert voices from industry. And um, I would encourage you to make sure that you register for that at foreignpolicy.com forward slash events. Lastly, we got a couple of questions on Colombia that unfortunately we weren't able to cover, um, but there is an article that we will post now in the Zoom chat about charges against former guerrilla commanders in Colombia's war crimes court. Um, and thank you all so much for joining in and I hope to see you at the next event. Thank you so much.